Could Congressman Ron Paul find lady luck in Nevada? We'll ask him next on Face to Face. This is Face to Face with John Ralston. Welcome to Face to Face. We'll bring you newsmakers and commentary you won't find anywhere else. Ron Paul trails the pack of Republican presidential contenders, but Paul says watch out. He expects to find his fortune in the caucus states, beginning right here in Nevada. I sat down with the congressman earlier today. Congressman, welcome back to the program. Thank Let's you. talk about the biggest issue in Nevada. Uh, I know you're doing an, uh, an economic press conference later. We're taping this. We'll talk about that in a moment. But foreclosure crisis, the housing crisis, biggest issue in Nevada, maybe one of the bigger issues in the nation. The president gave a speech today in which he started to f flesh out a little bit of what he said in his State of the Union. Let me show you what he said. Millions of victim of families who did the right and responsible thing, folks who shopped for a home that they could afford, secured a mortgage, made their payments each month, they were hurt badly by the irresponsible actions of other people who weren't playing by the same rules, weren't taking the same care, weren't acting as responsibly. You're a free market guy, you're a government hands-off guy. Can the government possibly keep their hands off, its hands off a crisis this large? Well, he's, he's partially correct. Some people did take advantage of the system and took advantage of the people by pr promoting the sale of houses when they shouldn't have been doing it. So yes, but he's wrong about where it originated. It originates on easy credit. It originates in the Federal Reserve. When interest rates are lower than they should be, people do things that they wouldn't have done otherwise. So on high interest rates, they don't build too many houses. They send the signal. It's an interference in price controls when you artificially lower interest rates. So if you don't deal with that, nobody understands the business cycle. So they, they have ignored that. Then you had the Community Reinvestment Act that told the banks that they had to loan to people even if they didn't qualify. Uh, at, at, the, at the same time, uh, the, the belief was that as long as you have inflation and the value of the house goes up, people can keep borrowing, it'll be perpetual prosperity. It was all an illusion. And then, of course, the people who were making a lot of money, they did make a lot of money off it, but then they got into the gambling, they got into the derivatives business. But that is a consequence of the bad monetary policy. So they've done that, and then they go into bankruptcy, and then the Obamas and the Republicans, other Republicans say, oh, we have to bail them out or the banks are going to go bankrupt. So they go in and compound it by bailing out the banks. And then who got the bad debt? The, the government and the Federal Reserve bought that debt, dumped it on the middle class. The middle class lost their jobs and they lost their houses. So everything they've done so far, including what he's proposing now, billions of dollars to go in and prop up bad debt. So he's partially right, but he doesn't understand the business cycle. And you're saying he's wrong about what caused it, and now he's wrong about the solution. Where we're right, but he's right about the fact that people took advantage of it. Uh, and I understand the Ron Paul, all evil springs from the Federal Reserve. We can well, talk it's about true. It. I, I understand you believe That's how you fight these wars. But, I, but, I understand, <laughs> but if people are watching this program, 80% uh, maybe the people who are watching this program are underwater on their houses. Right. They don't care about the Federal Reserve. They don't care about bailing out banks. They care about what are you going to do if you become president to help them. Is the answer nothing? Well, well, no. You want to you want to get the prices down. You want to liquidate de the debt. You don't want to bail out the big banksters, and you want you have to quit the bailouts in order for this debt to be liquidated. Now, one thing that the federal government does, and what Obama wants to do, is both both the leadership, both parties do it. Because the banks owe the debt, they securitize you know, the mortgages. The banks own this. They get in the derivatives business. The international banks own it. This is involved in the international crisis in Europe because that's where some of these mortgages are. So what is the guarantee? There's no incentive to help out the, the person that's holding the mortgage because the bankers say, hey, they bailed us out before, and Obama, and the, generally the Republicans, they always bail out the banks because they're scared to death of the banks going bankrupt. So the, the bank the guarantee that they will bail out the banks once again guarantees the banks won't meet up and and have an agreement with the people holding these mortgages so we're we're on fast track to continuing this process for another 10 years so if you want to do it for 10 years just keep doing the bailouts that we're involved in right now I know you're against TARP I know you're generally against fe federal, federal bailouts uh, again I'll ask you though uh, Obama's proposal I won't go into all the details you know some of it he wants to help people refinance their mortgages he wants to help people who are in distress who as he said in that speech through no fault of their own and I think you 
agree a lot of this happened through no fault of people of people they were induced because of the low interest rates or whatever or, or whatever reason the question is should the government be helping these people now through helping them refinance their mortgages and if you're not going to help these people how does it fix yeah, itself? But there's different ways of helping okay. sure you should help them but but let's say somebody has a uh, they're underwater and they're underwater a couple hundred thousand dollars and they have to liquidate which they probably will have to eventually uh, just propping it up is just delaying it give them a tax credit let them get back all their money you know off on a tax credit or something but spending more money the problem came from too much spending and too much debt so how in the world are you going to solve the problem of just spending more money and more debt. Where's, if I'm where's Obama grand, going to get the money? But if I'm 200 grand uh, underwater on my house, and believe me, there are people watching this who are saying, yeah, that's me. What, what are you going to do? What, what's a tax credit going to do for me? How's that going to help me out? Well, in the future, he, he won't have to pay income taxes for a long time. Is that right? Sure, he well, gets a tax credit. He gets it all off his taxes. All off of his taxes? Sure, he gets it off if, if they pass legislation that I would want. That's better than appropriating money and taxing you further. I mean, you want more taxes to bail out all the household people? He says five or ten billion dollars. What if it's fifty billion dollars? And, you know, they did offer programs similar to this. Nobody took advantage of it because governments are inefficient. This is how we got in this thing. We had too much government. To think we can get out of it by more government spending and more regulation and more bailouts is a pipe dream. More of that interview with Congressman Ron Paul when we come back. Welcome back across Nevada to Face to Face. And now back to my talk today with Republican presidential hopeful Ron Paul. Do you think everyone in, in the free market behaves well? I mean, do you think the banks behaved well in, in, in this situation, Congressman? You don't think that, I mean, obviously there, there may not, but some people think, and I know you don't think this, if more regulations had been in place or if better enforcement of current regulations had been in place, the banks couldn't have behaved better. Yeah, but, but your fallacy is that you're assuming that there was a free market. It had nothing to do with the free market. The market wasn't free, right? No. And it's it, not it now either. Matter of fact, I want more regulations by the free market. I didn't want to bail out the banks. This would have been over by now. Think, study. The, the banks would have gone under if you didn't bail out the banks, wouldn't they? The mm -hmm. banks would not have gone under? And that debt would have been liquidated, been off the books, and you wouldn't have owned it. You own it now. And so, so you're saying that the, what, but the housing bubble still would have burst here in Nevada, correct? Well, burst around the country, but right. that is just a major the worst part of it. Though. There was more speculation. Pardon me? There, it's just the worst here is what I'm saying now. The housing bubble still would have burst. If you don't bail out the banks, all the banks go under. Then what do we have? Anarchy? No, but if you, if you blame the free market when the free market wasn't existed, you don't let me get to finish my sentences okay, before sorry. you interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> no, the free market has stronger and stricter regulation. If you create a monetary system where mistakes are made and people do dumb things, like Obama was saying, that if you would only have regulations to regulate the mistakes that you've created, it's a fallacy. But the regulations in the free market are much more powerful because you have to live up to your contracts, you have to liquidate debt, you have to go into bankruptcy. You can't take taxpayers' money and bail out the banks. The people who are holding this debt should have suffered the consequences of this, and it would have been all over. This is why studying the, the Depression of 1921 is so important. That depression lasted one year, and that was a consequence of the inflation of World War I. But it was a non-event. But it was a crisis. One year, and it was over with, and everybody they went back to work again. So I, I want to finish, wrap up this discussion of this issue by saying essentially what you think the government's role is is to enforce the contracts that already exist, and that's about it. Is that is that is that right? Well, to to, to use bankruptcy laws and not dump debt on the taxpayer. I mean, why compound it if it was too much government interference and too much inflation and too many promises and and too much moral hazard? To say that the government, the, the moral hazard of the government bailing out, you know, uh, this whole system is the reason that banks have no incentive to make a deal with a person on, that's holding a mortgage. I'm saying the banker should have the incentive to work out the deal with that person holding the mortgage. Maybe reduce the sp spending. The bank gets to be becomes, you know, get some of his money back. At the same time, the person that had to write down some of his debt, he gets a tax benefit. I don't, I don't know how anybody could reject it. <laughs> it's you, so wonderful. You, yeah, you would be against the government trying to force the banks to do some kind of pr mass principal reduction program, right? You think that would where, be wrong? Where did this authority come from? Who invented this? I mean, that, that's, the, that's the type of thing that created the problem. That this affirmative action, the government do this, artificially low interest rates, buy your houses and live off the increase in the value. Now we're reversing it and we're unwinding it. The quicker you unwind it, the faster we'll get back to building houses again. All right, well, let's talk. This, this program is, is, is going to air 
uh, uh, after you have your press conference today at 3 o'clock. It's going to air. Uh, uh, we're taping this before. And tell us about your, your economic uh, uh, Nevada press conference. How are you going to, you're going to solve all of Nevada's well, economic Well, I'm not going to talk about my press conference right now. You're not? This, this isn't going to air until after your press conference. Well, I, I, I prefer to release that at that time. All right. Uh, I, I can't say I didn't try. Let's, let's talk about another economic issue. I'm sure you've heard about the controversial, maybe you don't think they're that controversial remarks, that one of your opponents, Mitt Romney, uh, made today. Let, let, me, let, me read, let me read those remarks to you. He's talking about what he wants to help the middle class. He says, I'm not concerned with the very poor. We have a safety net here. If it needs repair, I'll fix it. I'm not concerned about the very rich. They're doing just fine. You associate yourself with those remarks or not? I, I don't know what in context he's saying that. I'm not going to analyze what he was really thinking and what his intent was. I know that he's been misquoted before, and in the context of things, I'd let him explain that. Well, but, okay, l let's talk about that, because you know the Republicans, the, some people call it class war, uh, are going to be portrayed in the general election as not caring about the poor. And, and so when you hear someone say, I'm not really concerned about the very poor, what is it? What is Ron Paul you know, there's very little I agree with him on economic policy, but I don't agree that Mitt Romney doesn't care about the poor. Uh, where, where are your biggest, what separates you, do you think, from Mitt Romney, and let's, we can bring in Newt Gingrich, too, uh, on economic policy, do you think that people don't, don't really crystallize? Well, I think it's with the other three candidates. There's a disagreement because they're on one group. Uh, we disagree on foreign policy. They think that uh, spending forever overseas is a benefit to our national security. And I see it a threat to our national security and our economic security because in these last 10 years, we have been fighting wars uh, uh, and we've run up the national debt by $4 trillion, which was a contribution to the business cycle and the housing crisis because the money's being spent overseas instead of here. When it comes to monetary policy, none of them really care about uh, understanding the business cycle and what we have to do and why you can't solve this problem without looking at uh, some sort of monetary reform where you put restraints on the Federal Reserve. This idea that you can create wealth by just printing money, it's the most absurd idea ever created in mankind. So they all agree with this. And when it comes to bailouts and, and government intervention, uh, none of them are offering any cuts, you know, not one single dollar. Stick around, we'll be back with more of my interview with Congressman Ron Paul. Welcome back across Nevada to Face to Face. Now, back to my interview with earlier today with Republican presidential candidate Ron Paul. These people who came to your rally at, at the Green Valley Ranch here uh, on, on Tuesday night were chanting, end the Fed, end the Fed, you know, that they chant that a lot at your rallies. You just said put restraints on the Fed. Which is it? Should we just get rid of it or should we put restraints on it? Sure. I, I, think, I think it's both. I think, no, not the restraints as much as exposure. We need transparency. That's the number one. I worked on the audit of the Fed. If you read my book on it, I don't come on, uh, even though the book is called End the Fed, right. it's not like closing the Fed down in one day. I want exposure. They can spend $15 trillion bailing out the rich and the wealthy and the bankers and foreign banks as well. And we have no, rec you know, records of this. At the same time, uh, Congress has the responsibility. They spend more money, they're more involved, they have more power and control because they have control of the money than all of Congress does. So we need an audit. I think if we had an audit, and the further that they destroy the economy, uh, the more the people are going to demand a, a reform of the monetary system. If uh, we don't get rid of the Fed, it's restraining the Fed, why should they be able to create trillions and trillions of dollars without permission of the Congress? So I, I want, uh, I want the supervision of the Fed. I want the. Uh, I want to know what they're doing, and I want the Congress to live up to their responsibilities. At the beginning of this, when I asked you how your disagreements, you mentioned foreign policy, you mentioned foreign spending. Uh, what exactly would you do? I mean, you're not, you're not what, where Rick Perry was at one time, where you want to zero out the entire foreign aid budget, do you? Why not? Do you want to do that? Well, well, where do you get the authority to give, take money from you and give it to rich people, rich, rich governments overseas? That's what it is. It takes money from poor people in this country, and we extract it. We might, you say, oh, no, it's not poor people because they don't pay taxes. They suffer the consequence of higher prices because we print the money. But we send that money, and it's supposed to help the poor people. And all it does is enhance the people who buy weapons, and then that money comes back and they buy weapons. Like in Israel, so they can defend themselves. That's our biggest foreign yeah, aid client. Israel, Israel will be benefit, my viewpoint, because the Arab nations surrounding them, their potential enemies like Egypt and all, they get seven times as much money as Israel gets. If you add them all together, you're suggesting. Sure. Well, yeah, but, but Israel, but you're saying cut off aid to Israel? You really believe that? 
well, uh, certainly I want them to have their own sovereignty. They, we own them when we give them the money. They can't even develop a peace treaty with their neighbors without our permission. They can't even defend their borders without our, our permission. You know, in the early 1980s, I was the lone congressman to defend their position for bombing the nuclear site in Iraq because I think they give up too much if they give their, up their national sovereignty. And even Netanyahu, before the, before the Congress, it's just a little less than a year ago, came over, he says, we don't need American troops to defend us. We can take care of ourselves. And he can. And they are capable of taking care of themselves. What they don't need to do is give up their national sovereignty. And I think that's where they sacrifice way too much. And I think our policy is harmful to Israel. Just think of what's happening in, in that area. Like, uh, we, we propped up Mubarak. You know, we bought his friendship. We worked for a while. We coughed up 40 or $50 billion. But then the resentment finally came about. He's overthrown. The Al Qaeda's in there. Radical Islam is in charge. They're, now they're an enemy of Israel. So our foreign policy is not good for Israel. And I think we should have more confidence in Israel. We shouldn't try to bribe them by giving them money. We don't have the proper authority to do that. I think foreign aid is very detrimental on the long run. Quite frankly, we don't have any money. Okay. I mean, we're one point four trillion dollars in debt. I, I, Where are you going to get the money? I get the point, Congressman. I want to move on to just a couple of Nevada issues in the time that we have left. Uh, I know you're a big states' rights guy too, and I know you've weighed in before on the whole issue of Yucca Mountain. You don't think the rest of the states should be able to force that nuclear waste dump here, right. do you? That, yeah, that's your position, correct? Sure. Do you think the Obama administration then was correct in withdrawing the license application? Was that the right thing to do? Oh yes, I think so. And so, what do you do with the waste? Well, you know, we have a nuclear power plant in, in my district and it's been there for 30 years maybe or so. And I've been in that plant and there is a pit about as big as this room, a deep pit. And they say that's where the nuclear waste is. I've been there and I looked over there and I said it's all down in the bottom of that pit. I mean, it, it's not like, you know, it's as big as a battleship or anything. But no. The big problem with nuclear, I believe in nuclear power. I believe it's the cheapest, the most efficient, and the safest. But I don't believe they should get any subsidies. We shouldn't subsidize research. We shouldn't subsidize insurance. We need to find the market rate for uh, electricity. And when it comes to waste, the government shouldn't be the responsible p person. The people who run the nuclear power plant has the responsibility to make sure they harm nobody. So just keep it there on site then? You think that's okay? Well, they okay. can do that or they can start finding a place. Uh, but it's their uh, you responsibility, know, maybe, not maybe the if, uh, Maybe if they auction it off, there's, you know, we, we have some place, space in West Texas. They might, they might uh, bid for it. We'll be back with the final segment of my interview with Congressman Ron Paul. Stick around. John Ralston wants to hear from you. Call 702-633-8748. Send an email to John at RalstonFaceToFace.com. Welcome back. Let's go back now to my talk earlier today with Republican presidential contender Ron Paul. Well, what, what about the other big issue here, which is, is, is legalizing uh, Internet gaming? You think that should happen? I think people should have legalized freedom. Isn't that a freedom issue? I mean, sure. why not let people gamble on the Internet? Right. I think you, people should be free, and they should make their own decisions, and there should be no regulation of the Internet. Right now, we're winning our fight against the effort to regulate the Internet, this, uh, uh, you know, Stop Online uh, Piracy Act. We've won that one. That's been removed, although they're trying to still get around that thing. So people should have a right to their freedoms, and I don't know why should people should be so frightened about that. All right, so let's, let, let's talk about Ron Paul's candidacy. You think you're going to do better here in Nevada than you did in 2008? I think you surprised a lot of people, although I predicted you'd finish in second. You did finish in second. 14%. You're going to be better than that this time? Sure. How, how much bigger do you a think? A lot. A lot, really? You're going to win the state? Can you, can, can you beat Romney? Possibly, yes. How do you beat him here, considering all the votes. advantages? <laughs> Get more votes. And have a better organization. You, you know, you and have a greater appeal for the freedom message. People love freedom still. They do, and your message has always been freedom. So explain this to me then. Uh, uh, why have you not won yet? Why is that message not resonating? Well, I've won 14, uh, you know, 12 times in Texas where people knew me and understood In the it. presidential race, though, sir, in well, the first early, four states. It's early. We expect to win, uh, win you know, uh, quite a few. And uh, we're winning in the sense that we're always doing better, you know. Uh, but you haven't come close to winning a state yet. I guess what I'm saying is mm -hmm. if your message is so powerful. Yeah, and I know you believe Call me back in a month. You think you're going to win these caucus I think states. there's a very good chance. 
And you raised that, was it $13 million, I think, in the fourth quarter? The money is still coming in. You look at these rallies, I think there might have been 400 people oh, at the Green on, Valley Rally. We haven't had a 400 rally. We've had 1,000 people. Well, I, I saw the report in the Sun said yeah, 400. Well, I don't believe what you read in the newspaper. I never read. Okay. <laughs> but, 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 so, so you're getting all this enthusiasm. How come it's not translating into votes in some of these states, do well, you think? I, I think it is. At every state you look at now, doubled or tripled the vote four years ago. I mean, you have to realize that we're taking on the establishment. and. Uh, we're taking on the big money. We're taking on the uh, mainstream media. We're taking on the military industrial complex. We're taking on the, the banksters, the Federal Reserve System. Uh, we're defending liberty. We're not defending the special interests. The government now is run by special interests, clawing away at a shrinking pie, and is getting pretty vicious. We're defending the individual liberty of all people. And that's a challenge. So uh, to have it miraculous, I think. As far as I'm concerned, compared to what I think we were likely to do five years ago, I think we're doing fantastically. And I think if the momentum continues, even you might become surprised. Well, I'm not, listen, I'm not surprised by how well you're doing. I think you're going to do well in Nevada, whether, whether or not you win. Real quickly, time we have left, you, you, before you came here, you went to a meeting of Hispanics and politics, which is generally a Democratic organization. They, they might have been able to get a few Republicans in there. Talk about, the Republicans have been criticized a lot for, their, for alienating a really large interest group. There's one in Texas, certainly. You know, you know about it. In Florida, a large Hispanic population. Has the Republican Party missed the boat on appealing to Hispanic voters? Well, it sounds like it has been. I feel good about it because uh, I argued the case that freedom brings people together. And there's, uh, if you deal with individuals, you don't discriminate against people because they happen to belong to a group. But I identify with minorities, uh, you know, with the drug laws. They're discriminated against. I, I identify with minorities that they start regulating and policing and stopping people because they might be an illegal immigrant. I don't like you or I to have to re carry uh, a card. So if you have... Uh, Hispanics uh, or illegals having carrying cards and people who look like they might be Hisp uh, illegal carrying cards and you and I will have to carry them just to be fair. So I identify with that and I don't like those kind of regulations and I don't like the way they're unfairly treated with the drug war. So uh, my identity with personal liberties and, uh, and allowing people to do what they like as long as they don't harm other people is very attractive to everybody, especially minorities. Especially minorities. All right, Congressman, uh, appreciate your willingness to come on the program again. Nice to see you. Good luck on Saturday in the caucus. Thank, Thank you. you.